Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to IFMA's World Workplace Virtual 2020. We're so glad everyone can be here. Uh, this is our roundtable session, Isn't It Obvious? And I want to go ahead and uh, introduce everyone. Uh, I'm your moderator and IFMA staffer. My name is Bobby Vasquez. I'm based in Houston uh, at IFMA headquarters. I'm the editor of IFMA's FMJ. And with us today, we have Patty Cruz, she is a Vice President of Strategic Accounts for the Workplace Western Division of Target North America. She collaborates with end users and target teams to develop enterprise flooring programs. Uh, we also have with us Grant Morgan. He is the CEO and co-founder of R0 Systems, a biosafety company democratizing access to best hospital grade infection prevention technologies and protocols available today. So, uh, Grant and the R0 team, they work with FMs in various environments uh, to help develop uh, hygienic environments for employees and consumers to return to. We also have with us Stephen Nichols. He is with Otis Elevators and is a system engineer with cross-functional interest in research and development, product strategy, and architectural innovation. He's interested in finding simplicity in complex systems, as well as the intersection of human experiences and people-centered design. And lastly, we have Kate Fitchelman. She is the product manager for Gensler's Workplace Solutions product line, including WISC. Her product management success relies heavily on thoughtful communication and knowing what to communicate and when. And that's a great segue into our roundtable today because that's what we're talking about. Isn't it obvious? Communication, how much is too much? And when is enough enough? And when is it not enough? Uh, who wants to go ahead and, and get us started about uh, just trying to get buy-in and uh, from not just the C-suite, but from our our uh, end users. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here, Bobby, and kick it off. Um, so um, we're in a really unique moment in time where um, the the FM's responsibilities and, and, and scope of their role has, has drastically expanded. Um, most of the FMs we're working with are not epidemiologists, uh, nor do they have a biology background, but um, still they, they are tasked oftentimes with um, you know, sourcing different types of solutions to, to keep their facilities safe and, um, and then also communicating that in a lot of cases. And um, in, in, uh, in our experience, in our opinion, um, there's no such thing as too much communication in a time like this. And, um, um, and I think people are looking to FMs um, as the, the source of the truth. Um, what we're finding is a lot of employees and consumers and customers are, um, are scared. Uh, people don't really know what to do. And, um, and, and the FMs that we've worked with have done a lot of work to do research and make sure that they're uh, picking the right products, uh, you know, putting in place the right protocols. Um, and that's something that FMs should be proud of. And, and they should communicate that uh, to their um, to the people that, uh, uh, that are stakeholders that they work with. And um, there's various different forms of communication, but um, when in doubt, over communicate and, and be proud of the work that you've done. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on this is, I think the, the other really important thing while you're communicating is to explain the why. Um, take credit for the work that you did, explain you know, why you chose a certain uh, tool or technology, explain why you have certain protocols in place. Um, and uh, I think that helps people wrap their heads around um, you know, how to comply and uh, gets them more comfortable with, uh, with whatever the solutions might be that you're putting in place. Anybody want to jump in and add to that or? No, so I, Grant, I I'll pick off where you left off about the why. I, I think communicating the why and understanding the why is critically important regardless of the audience. I, I think wh whether you're a facility manager or really any role, we're both kind of communicators and consumers of information. So, so while I, I completely agree with you that kind of over communicating, communicating and communicating again, especially in, a, in times of change is really important. I think we're all also kind of tat or constantly balancing information overload. We can't possibly be um, uh, consuming everything that's coming at us. And I think kind of sorting through all of that and finding right ways to pass it on at the right time in the right way, because every audience is a little bit different and, and people, the, the habits that they've established, whether it's 
interpersonal communication or, or systems communicating to them need to be taken into account. Now, I really, oh, sorry. sorry, Patty. Go ahead, Patty. I was just going to say, in regards to Grant's point on over communication, I think that's one of the things that we have to really consider right now, too, in, in over communicating. I think you should change up the format as to how you communicate, be very concise and to the point. Um, you know, we're all very overwhelmed right now with over emails, getting so many emails, so much information. And so that I think if the subject line is to the point and then uh, the data is uh, up to date, relevant, and then uh, changing up the format. One week you present it one way and then the next week you do another way. There's lots of new technology, obviously, that we're all learning about. And then um, to Stephen's point, people, you know, we do have to say the message over and over because people retain information differently. We learn and sometimes it's, you have to keep adding that information over and over so they retain it. Absolutely. And Stephen, when you had talked about um, the over communication that's happening right now, and Patty touched on it as well, I think one of the most important things in, in, to mitigate that is the just in time communication, knowing what to communicate at the right time and not too early and not too late. And if you get it too early, people will ignore it or forget about it. And then when they do need it, they won't have it. And if you do it too late, then they're not able to adequately prepare for whatever they need to prepare for that they'll use that information. Um, Patty, you also mentioned relevant, and I think that's a really important topic as well. Uh, different audiences need different types of messaging, and they have, um, you know, de depending on what you do, you're going to use that information in a different way. So making sure you tailor the message specific to the person receiving it will make it more relevant to them, and therefore they're ca they'll care about it more, which is really important when you're trying to gain buy-in. And that goes back to grants uh, with the why. If you make the why relevant to them and tailored to them, they're gonna buy in and, and they're really gonna appreciate that. So, so let's throw this out there. What, what happens when uh, it, it's a fluid situation? You know, right now we're all dealing with the pandemic and what's communicated today may not be the, the same tomorrow. Or we may be asking, why are we doing things a certain way? How, how do we uh, keep, keep pace with the fluidity of the subject? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll jump in here too. I think um, kind of dovetails into the last the last uh, uh, part of the discussion where I think that um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll steal from uh, uh, I'll steal from a couple of things that were that were said. But um, one of the things that we recommend too is that you practice uh, asynchronous communication. So um, something as simple as like a Google Doc uh, that is a living, breathing, uh, current source of the truth that people can come to and reference on their own time without having to have a one-on-one uh, -on -one direct conversation with you. Um, and then anytime that there are changes to that document, then you can go through the channels that you communicate with your constituents or stakeholders um, and, and notify them of that change. Hey, our understanding of this situation has changed and we've updated this policy or, or this procedure or protocol accordingly, um, but then always point back to that same like Google Doc or, or web page or whatever, whatever it is that is your current source of the truth. But uh, having that Current source of the truth is is really important, um, and then and then the the communications about changes can be sort of bite sized micro communications, um, and also have the secondary effect of reminding people that they do have this repository of information um, that is the source of the truth at any given time. Yeah, no. So Grant, it's interesting, and I just you mentioned earlier that facility managers not epidemiologists, and and that's a it 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 it, it struck me because. I think, especially now, when very few of us are epidemiologists, we're all trying to kind of learn and, and, and come up to speed on what is today, as Bobby mentioned. And I think this is where, to me, the analogy that makes sense is all information is in layers and, and, and kind of we all need to be kind of learning what that next layer is and, and the over communicating and making sure that we're getting it just in time, as Kate mentioned, is important. Um, so one of the analogies that some of the team member, my team members and I have been talking about is, is if you think of like Gone with the Wind is in a thousand page book and a three and a half hour movie, almost four hours. But if you look at the movie trailer and the movie poster, you know what the story is about. 
And some people want the movie poster, some people want to read the book, and all of those things are linked together. So I think for some of us that are designing technology to help, being able to click on the movie poster and get down into those other levels of information, or being able to peel back that, those layers to find a way to get to an epidemiologist, for example, if you really need those details. This is where, it, it, to me, it's not just the what and the when, but it's sort of at what level detail and finding that, that scope for, for the right audiences. And then also, I think once the fluidity is going, uh, you need to get some feedback as to if people are understanding uh, what you, the communication that you've sent out. So that, you know, there's surveys, there's all kinds of different ways of communicating that, but I think getting feedback is also relevant so that you know that people are understanding what you're trying to get across. Yeah, because it, it ideally communication is at least a two way, if not a more dynamic process. Yeah, that, that feedback loop um, is something that as a product manager, I use all the time and is absolutely imperative because you need to understand, did, did people understand your message? Do they need more? Do they need less? Do they need it more timely? Um, was it not in time? What are they going to do with it? And really finding out how they're going to use that information so that you can continue to um, really uh, work with them moving forward and making sure you're communicating to them the, the, the way that they would expect. Um, the one thing that I would recommend for feedback is a technique called powerful questions. And it's really about asking the most open-ended question that you can to allow people the ability to give you feedback on whatever they wanna give you feedback on and making sure that in your questioning, you're not using leading questions or putting your own bias into the question because really, the purpose of the question is to find out information from them in whatever they want to share. And, and I'll throw one more thing out here at the risk of throwing a wrench in the gears. Um, I think uh, we're not in this alone. Um, and I think that not every responsibility has to fall on onto the FM. Um, but uh, I, I'd encourage people too, if you have people within your organization that are good communicators or that handle internal communications like, like an HR team or your leadership team or whatever it may be, enlist them. Just ask for help, raise your hand, and, um, and I'm sure uh, uh, they can help as well. But um, uh, you know, they may be uh, looking to you for the content of that communication. Um, but uh, by all means, I encourage you to, to engage other people within your organization and the rest of your team to help. Oh, Grant, that's a great point. And, and I think it's, it's interesting because to your point, the role of a facility manager is changing and they really are now at the front lines of so much. And, and to Kate's point, it, they, everyone is asking questions of ourselves and kind of of everyone that we're interacting with of, of how do we get better at all of these kinds of things. And to me, it's really finding that balance um, it, it is, is it's always changing and it's going to be different depending on the context and the, the audience and, and really the content too. I think that helps with the messaging, even if there's someone new and it's a different person that's presenting and getting the information across, they may communicate in a way that touches people, that that will be the way that that person will learn and be touched by the information. Absolutely. And I think it's helpful, you know, when we're, when we're com communicating both vertically and horizontally, giving other people tips and tricks to cascade information as well. So it isn't just you learning, but to Grant's point, you're not in this alone. You have friends, um, so help teach them some good communication tricks um, and techniques so that they can cascade. And now um, everybody is, is, has the same message and is sharing the same message. It's a really interesting point, Kate, because to me, one of the things I think is challenging sometimes is we don't always know whether we're communicating vertically or horizontally, or we're doing the same at, at, at the same time. So my, my gone with the wind analogy is a little bit silly, but if there's a way to send the movie poster, the movie trailer, and a link to the movie all together so that people can choose which level and it's all one story, that, that, that really can help, whether that's the building system communicating to the facility manager or the facility manager communicating to any one of their stakeholders or someone in their ecosystem. And I'm loving the analogy, Stephen, keep it up. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, to be honest, I it, it it's funny because a bunch of people keep poking me on different movies. But the thing that I like about Gone with the Wind is that iconic movie poster is re even understood to someone like my my small children who they can look at it and they know exactly what the story is about without mm -hmm. reading the 1100 page book. So so one thing that's kind of been a game changer in in FM is that all of a sudden, uh, you know, FM had been able to communicate whatever its needs or instructions were to its end user through IT or HR. But now FM is a little bit more of a uh, transparent two-way street. How, how is that changing the game as far as uh, making these types of communications happen? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things that that can be difficult is if you don't have clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Um, and so so I think that, you know, it's incumbent upon um, upon everybody. But, uh, you know, I encourage the FMs to do this. But um, if there's if there's lack of clarity, um, just ask questions internally, but make sure that um, you clearly have defined, you know, who's responsible for um, drafting the communication and the content of the communication, who's responsible for sending it out. Um, who's responsible for fielding, uh, fielding any questions that come out of it. Um, but um, yeah, I think it, it's important to draw those lines and, and assign those roles and responsibilities uh, and just be really clear on them up front. So, uh, so th there's nothing lost in a handoff and there's no uh, missed expectations with you know, kind of fingers uh, pointing in different directions and, and a bunch of question marks. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to um, call, call back something that Stephen had mentioned earlier about he's all about simplicity and seeing how you take complex things and make it more simple. Communication channels are the exact same way. The more people that it, are receiving communication, the more cascading that needs to happen, the more complex those communication channels get, especially when we're adding in lots of different technologies and tools and multiple different ways to be communicated to and communicate back. So one thing I would mention is, along with grants, you know, roles and responsibilities of the people, really identify what are the right tools for the right type of communication and uh, making sure that your technology is as simplistic as possible and adding value versus adding complexity. If you find that your technologies are adding more complexity than value, um, really take a look at that and see where you can simplify. No, I, I, it's a great point, Kate. And I think what, to me, one of the things that I hear that's underneath what you and Grant just mentioned is, is the notion of habit loops. I, I think a lot of us, even if we don't realize them, a lot of the way we communicate, the way we consume information, the way we go through all of our day is based on habit loops. And, and to be honest, I think it, 2020 has been such a period of change. It, it's hard to uh, really fathom how much change it has been. And I don't know about you, but I, I'll, I'll, I'm personally kind of a little bit tired of, of the phrase new normal, in part because A, I, I don't like the singularity of it. I think normal is, 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 there's a spectrum and there's a plurality to it. But also what is normal is always changing. Our habits over the past months, as we've all kind of worked remotely um, or, or rebalanced during the pandemic have changed. And our habits have always been changing. So, so figuring out how to leverage those habits as they change with new technology or new communication pathways um, is, is, is a challenge for all of us. And this is where going, going back to what is simple, what is meaningful, back to something we started with is what is important for why we're doing this um, and looping all those together is important. It's, it's worth asking that second or third question to make sure you're doing this well. Yeah, thanks. Great points. And sorry I was late to the game. And um, thanks to Bobby for sending me the, the link. Um, our firewall here where I worked is, is not a fan of Zoom. So I have issues trying to get on. So. But uh, great points from what I've been on maybe five minutes now. Um, and another observation I have, um, what we go through here in other, other companies in our um, area, because I'm active in our local IFMA chapter, is like people have email fatigue. And especially here, we have a big, we're in a big corporation, so we have a big communications department. So they push out about every two weeks. They'll do kind of a newsletter and it's later stuff. If we're having something big facilities-wise, a power outage, you know, maybe some road work, so traffic patterns need to change, we put it in there. But then invariably, we can tell from the questions we get as a facilities team, nobody bothered to read it. 
So certainly short and to the point, but that's our biggest issue. And yeah, we've, we've tried other methods of, of pushing out communications and we still get the same result. So I think a lot of people are, I know, I know I have and a lot of our people are very busy right now, um, but it's like, how do, you, how do you get people to read and digest the important information we're trying to push out? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And people definitely do. I mean, I have email fatigue, I have Zoom fatigue, but um, but I think that uh, it, it is uh, it is important to duplicate or replicate that communication across multiple channels and reinforce it perhaps multiple times. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in emails, timing matters. So, you know, making sure that it's at the top of their inbox when they, you know, walk into the, into the office or at the virtual office, I guess. Um, right. Uh, is important, but then also, um, I don't know if there's like an intranet uh, for your company that you can post it on or uh, social media uh, that you subscribe to, a Slack channel um, that you subscribe to, but whatever communication channels exist within your within your company um, can be important. And then uh, a couple other ones like meeting, uh, like regular meetings or rituals that you guys do. So for example, all hands meetings, um, get it on the agenda and just point it out so people know it exists. Um, if there are uh, parts of your organization that have regular like team meetings, um, you know, get the communication, uh, get those leaders to actually, uh, you know, put a bullet point on their agenda to, to highlight this, but um, you kind of have to get creative and, and a little bit scrappy, but, um, you know, just think broadly, like where, where are, where do people communicate within the organization and go, uh, you know, go to those channels? Um, because you're right, like people, generally speaking, are going to you know, reach out and look for it. Um, I, I think it, it's got to come to them in various different forms. And, and we should also sort of expect to have to re-communicate multiple times as well. Hey, did you want to jump in on that too? I think you, you had something. Oh, I was just, I was just going to mention that um, one of the things that may help Albert is uh, talking to some people that you trust to give you very candid feedback and honest feedback about why they're not reading the emails. As soon as you understand why people aren't paying attention or aren't looking at the information that you're pushing out there. It may help to identify potentially a better way, um, like some of the suggestions that Grant made there. Um, and then also just making sure that you um, are really understanding the audience and how they consume information. So, uh, and Stephen, I think you had some. Yeah, so I, I think the other thing, and this is, e email is an interesting one to me because Honestly, I think we all have email fatigue and there's fundamentally, yeah. I mean, email fundamentally is a push communication. People, people, you get email when someone else wants you to get the email, you're not consuming it kind of when you're ready or when you want. So like, to, like for the intranet page that Grant mentioned, being able to know that I can go to that intranet page or this screen in my building or that screen in my elevator kind of thing for the latest news or information, I, I can get it when I need it in the way that I want it. So in some ways it's, I think to, to Kate's point, finding the questions and balancing what works for the population and the stakeholders. I, I mean, email is easy, so we all use it, but there's, there's lots of other formats now. And I think finding the, the right balance is, is really the tricky part. And there's, it's, Every building, just like every person, is a slightly different. So we got to find different ways to do it. So, and great simple. point. We we do have a home. We do have an intranet. So anytime you open your browser, that's the first thing that automatically pops up. And so it's it's there. We also have quite a few monitors around the building that's scrolling all of those kind of announcements and upcoming events and things going on. And I think to your point, Albert, when you mentioned the newsletter, because our company puts that out as well, and sometimes it's, we talked a little bit earlier about short, concise, to the point, and sometimes those newsletters, you start scrolling through and reading the blurb, and then, you know, you're like, oh, okay, whatever, and then you just, yeah. you know, <laughs> don't go to the very end, and I'm sure we're all like that. We miss some of those important details. Yeah. Well, when we're communicating those things out, um, what about uh how, how do we communicate consequence of not following protocol or or reading patty you want you want to jump on that well i think that that's a great point and i think that that's something that we have to think about and and how is that message and that information getting across i i don't really have a good answer to a consequence on that but um 
Well, so one of the things if we can come that, up with that solution, I'd be all over that. <laughs> <laughs> You'll read about it in the next right. FMJ, I promise you. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the one of the things that I use to to Patty's point of you know making it making sure that it's relevant because there is a lot of information in those newsletters. One of the things that I like to use is the what's in it for me approach. So whenever you're sending the information to somebody, uh, instead of focusing on the consequences of them not paying attention to the information, <laughs> instead um, focusing on the what's in it for them. What do they get? What do they gain? You know, what's the benefit of them having this information and what can they do with it? And that's part of tailoring it and, and back to the why and, and those different things. Um, Patty had mentioned relevance, uh, making sure the message relevant. Now, uh, so the, 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 the thing that jumped into my mind is, is that we have to trust that people are gonna get the information they need in the way that they need it. So I think one of the challenges, so we talked briefly about kind of an email, a newsletter, an intranet, a screen. I think the challenging thing is that we probably, depending on the population of most buildings, you can't eliminate one of those. You need all of them and probably some more in order to get to the right people because different people like to consume things in different ways. And, and that's just human nature and we need to celebrate that diversity. But it, in some ways, finding um, the way to, so, so that they have that trusted way of communicating and they're getting what they need when they need it, um, that, that's the balance. Oh, you're muted, Bobby. Bobby, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. We are at two o'clock. Uh, we can go a, a couple of minutes longer if uh, to our to our guests. If you have uh, another session that you are planning to attend at two p.m., now would be the time to jump off. But uh, I think uh, just because of the, the the circumstance of okay, there goes one. Uh, the, <laughs> the circumstance of how things started off, we can go a couple more minutes. Um, to our attendees, do y'all have any questions or, or comments that y'all would like to add? You can definitely, uh, uh, you know, either unmute or uh, raise, raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we can discuss that here in our uh, closing moment. Uh, do keep in mind that this is being recorded, so you will have the opportunity to go back, uh, I believe it's through December the 31st, and rewatch our session and uh, um, unfortunately things didn't get off the uh, technically the way we wanted them to. So if you missed a couple of things, uh, they uh, we did record so you'll be able to catch up. But uh, if you have anything that you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to do so. I'll give it a couple of moments, see if anyone has anything or if they wanna chat, put something into the chat box. If that's an awkward silence, right? <laughs> uh, does anyone have like a pain point or something that, you know, they've experienced that they want to share that kind of like, you know, uh, a, a specific experience that you're drawing on that uh, led you to the, you know, either facilitating or, or uh, sitting in on this, on this talk? Well, for us again, we, um, in our day to day, individual communications when somebody's moving they get a move notice you know here's here's what you should do in preparation for your move so again we also know from that questions we get back that people are what people haven't done they haven't taken the time to read and digest the communication so that's the pain point for us uh, Albert that's a really good one because moving is a is a change and this is where I think whenever we're experiencing a change is when all of this is even more important and that's the amazing thing right now is we're all experiencing change at some level and mul probably multiple levels yeah and adding to what Stephen just said you know when we talk about any kind of change change is very emotional so if you just Google change curve, you'll see many different variations. Um, but there's also uh, the very same change curve where you kind of take this dip before you have those new behaviors and new habits that, that get you used to the change. So when you are experiencing um, change, when people are experiencing change, it's just good to remember that the emotional state will cause people to react in ways they usually wouldn't. And also um, people will consume information in ways that they, maybe they wouldn't if they weren't in a state of change. So something else to remember when communicating whenever there's change happening. I think the word empathetic is really relevant 
right now in all kinds of instances with this pandemic. I think we all are experiencing things differently. So I think just being empathetic is important to remember. Yeah, and then the, the other thing is tying this back to the just-in-time communication piece. I think uh, moving is a uh, move notice is a really good example, but um, I think just trying to do your best to anticipate when is somebody going to actually need this information and therefore when might they ask you questions about it and try to time the communication and put it in a format um, that is conducive to that. So if it's not a move notice, then uh, maybe it's in office protocols for social distancing or mask wearing or whatever it might be. Um, what you mentioned, Albert, about the the, um, uh, the the monitors that you guys have with with news scrolling and whatnot, um, that you know a monitor at the front entrance of the building would be a really good place to uh, to reinforce that that communication um, because ostensibly when you're walking into the, into the office, um, you're going to wonder, well, how do I how do I act? Um, what do I do? If the like restrooms are going to be closed for two hours at a time or every two hours for for cleaning or disinfection, for example, um, post a sign on the restroom door to let people know. Um, so it's just thinking about those little it's the little details about when is this person going to need this information and how can I get it in front of them um, at that right point in time uh, where, where uh, and alleviate the, really the goal is to alleviate them asking a question or or, or not knowing and doing something wrong. Yeah, and and I agree. But I, to Albert, the thing that strikes me is, I mean, I think Patty and, and Kate really summed it up with emotion and empathy. I mean, it, we, we can debate emails versus signs versus newsletters until the cows come home kind of thing. But fundamentally, this is all people to people and, and getting that message to the people, to, to the person in a way that they care about is what's most important. All right. Well, I think we're going to end it right there uh thank you so much everyone for bearing with us uh we appreciate everyone uh coming in and and logging in and sharing uh their experiences thank you very much to our attendees and uh patty kate grant and steven thank you very much for joining us today uh, again this is recorded so if you missed anything uh it will be on the ifma uh, website throughout uh, the rest of the year uh, thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of World Workplace and FMs. Thank you all so much for doing what you all do. The world is uh, finding you. a way because of you. So thank you all so much. Oh, thank, you. thank you for having thank us. You. Everyone take care. All right. Thank you.